Well, good morning. I bring you greetings from the great state of Texas. And uh, we are more than happy to let you all live here with us in this state, in this country. <laughs> Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be reading the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's a little bit lengthy, but this entire section goes together. Jesus is going to begin by giving a call, an invitation, if you will, and then he is going to proceed to give warning. Now you've already sat, but let's stand again in honor and reverence to God's word. Let's look at Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name do many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, and the rivers came, and the winds blew and fell against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone hearing these words of mine and not doing them may be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. Please be seated. Perhaps you were trained in personal evangelism to ask someone this question. When you stand before Jesus after you die, and if Jesus asked you, why, I, why should I let you into my heaven, what would your answer be? Even if you might phrase it a little bit differently, it's a good evangelistic diagnostic question. Can you think of a more important question for us to not only ask, but rightly answer? For the past two days, we have heard powerful sermons and we basked in the glorious doctrines of salvation. Have we not? How tragic it would be for any of us to have heard these truths expounded, affirmed what we've heard, leave this conference thinking we're okay, and then stand before Jesus someday to hear him say, I never knew you. After all the encouraging preaching on the gospel that we've heard, why talk about this on the final day of the conference? the task I've been assigned to talk about. Well, if the preaching of Jesus is our example, it seems that faithful proclamation of the gospel will be accompanied with warnings of the real and present dangers that exist for those who hear gospel truth. It's exactly how Jesus ends 
The greatest sermon ever recorded in the history of the world. There's never been a greater preacher than Jesus, so I would say there certainly has never been a greater sermon. And in his conclusion, he drives his hearers to the point of a decision which all good preaching does by calling upon them to enter the narrow gate in verse 13. At the end of this sermon, Jesus doesn't have Peter play the keyboard in the background. Or a Hammond organ. As he stirs up the emotions to get as many decisions as possible, he gives an invitation that calls for a costly choice. And he presents a real and present danger, revealing how it's possible for you and me to think we've entered into his kingdom. When in actuality, you're self-deceived. And you're headed toward eternal destruction. This is gracious. If you need this warning this morning, as we all do to examine, this is gracious. Four parts to Jesus' conclusion. I want you to see this as we walk through it. There's four pairs of contrast. At the beginning and the end of this, there's a similarity because you have two twos. You have two gates and paths and two houses and foundations. And then in the middle, you have two trees and you have two professions. All of them are reinforcing the same concept, coming judgment. There's a warning of two dangers, or I should say a warning of, of a choice of two paths. And then there's a warning of two dangers, two trees and two professions, and a tale of two houses or foundations that have only two outcomes, stand or fall. And what we will hear here, here, here in this section is what we do with Jesus' words determine whether we stand or fall in eternity. Let's look at the first one. In verses 13 to 14, we see Jesus in his conclusion gives a choice of two paths. He begins his conclusion by exhorting his hearers to enter the narrow gate of his kingdom. There's not enough preaching that calls upon people to respond. Jesus does that. He's not giving... A religious lecture. And if we were to draw from the beginning of his sermon, this entrance that he's calling them to would be to confess your spiritually bankrupt state, to mourn over your sinful condition, to humble yourself before God, and come to him for the righteousness that he alone can give you. But as Jesus stands at the narrow gate imploring you to enter, there is another gate that's beckoning you to come. It's a wide gate that is so enticing with its blinking lights and its vast openness. Crowds can get through this wide gate and the road is broad with, with countless people on it. And Jesus warns though that there's looming danger through this gate and down this path because it leads to eternal destruction. But it's enticing. You can enter through this gate and you can be whoever you want, live any way you want. You have to leave nothing behind, including your sinful desires and attractions. No real repentance, no dying to self. You can bring all the religiosity we'll see that you want with you. And self-righteousness doesn't have to be relinquished. The other gate and the other path is narrow. In fact, the, the path doesn't broaden out after you go through the gate. It's a narrow gate. It's a narrow path. It's the exact opposite of the wide gate. The narrow gate rejects the concept of man's inerrant righteousness as Jesus even introduced his sermon, talking about our need to hunger for righteousness. You'll have to leave friends behind who are on the broad path. You must leave self behind. You must pick up your cross and follow Christ. You may even have to leave family behind as Jesus comes not to bring peace with the sword and he divides even mother and daughter, father and son. No wonder, no wonder there are few who find the narrow path. 
Sadly, though, some don't find the narrow gate because they heard a gospel invitation that actually invited them through the wide gate while calling it Christianity. Too many evangelistic calls attempt to make the entry as wide as possible with as few hindrances as possible, squeezing as many people through as possible. I recently heard a mega church SBC pastor who sadly was also the chairman of the board of the church planting arm of the SBC. He was bragging about his church, and let me quote what he said. We have transgender, LGBTQ, straight, single, married, divorced, and cohabitating people. Now listen to his words. These same people, he says, attend, listen, serve, grow, and give. That's not the kingdom of the narrow gate and the narrow path. That's the wide gate and the broad path. Part of the problem is that type of invitation system where the gate is widened so that anyone can get through with even the slightest commitment. Part of the problem. Part of the problem is, is a lack of church discipline, of unrepentant sin in the church, where they're okay with making people feel comfortable walking on the broad path without ever warning them. It's tragic because people's eternities are at stake. Yet many churches show little to no concern to be sure that the names written on their church roll exhibit any evidence that those same names have been written on the Lamb's Book of Life. It's not so with Jesus. He loves us too much to coddle us into hell. He didn't pass out response cards at the end of his sermon to ask for hands to be raised for those who wanted to join his kingdom. He didn't offer a sinner's prayer to quickly recite. His invitation wasn't, belong before you believe. Jesus gave an illustration that called upon them to leave everything behind and enter his kingdom through the narrow gate. The word that Jesus uses there for narrow gate indicates a very small gate that one person can barely pass through. It's, it's a one-at-a-time proposition, if you will. It's the exact opposite of the wide gate. But he moves from this choice that he gives to then in verses 15 to 23 to give a warning of two dangers. First, if we want to be careful not to enter the wide gate or end up on the broad path of destruction, in verses 15 to 20, he says there are outside dangers that we need to be aware of. False prophets are going to rise up and they're going to encourage you to enter the wide gate and they will work hard to keep you on the broad path. They are deceptive because they come in sheep's clothing. Their teaching is often subtle. It's likely hard to detect if you aren't discerning and watchful. They mock those who give warnings about the wide gate and the wide path. They'll call those giving warnings legalistic, hyper-fundamentalists. Because they're looking to increase the number on their path, not the number on Christ. But not only are false prophets deceptive, they're dangerous, Jesus says. Outwardly they come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. They will de devour and they will carry as many people to the path of destruction as possible. Therefore, we must be on guard against them. Because they're deceptive, they'll deny their false prophets and they'll often sound like true prophets. So we need to know how to identify them. And Jesus explains that these false prophets will be known by their fruit. 
Now, we don't have time to examine that this morning, but Jesus says elsewhere in Matthew that their identifying fruit is the content of their teaching, their personal character, and the character of those who follow their teaching. But that's not the primary danger that I've been asked to address this morning. After warning about the dangers of false prophets, he then warns about the danger of false professions. For many, the greatest danger they face is not dangers from without, but dangers from within. Not the deception of false teachers, but the deception of self. In verses 21 to 23, you see in the text here, we learn a sobering truth. We learn that the number of those who will enter the kingdom of heaven is smaller than the number of those who profess to belong to Jesus. Not everyone who calls Him Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of the Father will enter. No exceptions. If you water down Jesus' word, you do so at your own peril. First, entering the kingdom of heaven is more than a verbal profession. It's more than that. There are many who will profess Jesus as Lord who won't enter. And if we take Jesus' warning seriously, it's quite possible, maybe even likely, that there are people in this room who have said, Lord, Lord, but if judgment day were today, you will not enter heaven. You've made a false profession. And this brings me back to the opening question. If you stand before Jesus on judgment day and he asks you why he should let you into heaven, what will you say? Well, look here in the text at what Jesus says will be said by many. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? It's important to remember that Jesus is not issuing this warning to irreligious men. He's addressing those who were deeply committed to religion. And he says there will be individuals who will stand before him on judgment day who seemingly have all the right credentials that would be thought in in that day to guarantee their entrance. How shocked this crowd was when Jesus earlier said in the sermon that your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees who were the most fastidious law keepers, at least from what they told people. This warning should wake us up because he doesn't say there are few who will make a false profession on judgment day, but many. And the warning gets increasingly alarming because I don't know if you notice, these people don't just say things. It's not just about a verbal profession won't get you into heaven, but they had done things. A busy, busyness, religious busyness won't get you into heaven. Examine their profession. I'm going to build and expand upon John Stott's observations that he made on this. First, it's an orthodox profession. Jesus is saying there will be those in the history of the church who will confess His divinity, Lord, Lord, but have no saving relationship with Him. Second, their profession is passionate. Lord, Lord, the repetition emphasizes it's an enthusiastic profession. Third, it's a public confession. These were not your... Mine's a private faith, thank you very much. (laughs) Their profession was made for all to hear. They shouted from the rooftops. They They felt confident in front of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Fourth, it was a profession that produced results. There seemed to be outward powerful evidence that they were the real deal. They prophesied or preached in Jesus' name. They cast out demons in His name. They performed miracles in His name. You know what I think one of the most stunning things about this? The most stunning things about what these individuals claim? It's not what they claim to have have done that that they think guarantees them entrance into heaven. 
The most stunning thing to me is how many people today think they'll enter heaven on far less claims. Much of today's cultural Easter Christmas Christianity, it doesn't take nearly as much for people to show up to your funeral and believe you're in heaven. If you have the same likes and dislikes about social morals or certain political positions, you'll likely pass as a Christian. Sometimes as parents, we get so anxious to get our children to profess Christ that we can lead them in a lifetime of delusion to believe they're Christians simply because they merely said all the right things. So if you pray to sinner's prayer at a young age, People will count you in the kingdom no matter how you lived. I recently saw a commercial by Franklin Graham, about a 30 second, 45 second commercial addressing people regarding the pandemic. My heart was broken when he says, pray this prayer. God, I sinned. I'm sorry. I believe Jesus is your son. I want to trust you as my savior and invite you in my heart. That was it. Now, he tells you to call afterwards, but how many people say, well, you know, a call's not going to matter. I did what he told me. I prayed the prayer. My goal is not to pounce on Franklin Graham. I'm thankful for a heart that wants to see more people saved. My goal is not to get you to doubt your salvation or the salvation of others. It's not to be lazy about evangelism. It's not to squelch your desire to see your children to come, know, come to know Christ at a young age. The issue is we need to be aware of the danger of being personally deceived into thinking we're a Christian when we're not. And the danger of offering a quote-unquote gospel that facilitates people to think they're saved when they're not. The only two places you'll find Jesus are at the narrow gate and the judgment seat. He's not on the broad path. He's not at the wide gate. But before we on, pounce on Graham or some other preacher, could it be, Pastor, that the greatest danger for your people is not the preaching of Joel Osteen, but your own? Preaching that lowers the bar in order to make it easier for people to respond. Biblical preaching must call for a response. And there are many preachers that preach, quote-unquote, sermons that never call upon people to enter the narrow gate. Jesus called for people to make a choice. In fact, if your preaching doesn't demand a response, you gave a religious lecture, not a sermon. There's nothing wrong with religious lectures. But not in the pulpit. We must call for the right response. And one reason we have so many false professions being made is because we have so many deficient gospel responses being preached. Our goal is not to get more professions. We're responsible to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. And nothing but the truth about what a genuine profession is. Pastors, you're not responsible, and praise God for this, you're not responsible for the results of your preaching. Amen. But you are responsible for the faithfulness to the message of the gospel call. God forbid that our preaching would contribute to the increasing number of self-deceived people. I'm not saying that we should raise barriers for people that Jesus didn't put up, but we most certainly should not lower barriers that He intentionally raised. Now notice something in this text. Jesus doesn't correct those in this passage on any of their claims. He doesn't deny their claims. It's worse than that. He doesn't deny their claims. 
he denies them. In one of the most penetrating passages in all of Scripture that should shake us all the way down to the bottom of our feet. Jesus says, I never knew you. Of course, anyone who is a Christian will believe and say, Lord, Lord, to Jesus, right? Someone who refuses to believe and say, Lord, Lord, won't enter his kingdom. There are no secret agent Christians in this life or the next. But you can be orthodox about your belief in Christ, his death as a substitutionary atonement, his resurrection and his return, and not be truly saved. You can be fervent in your claims and have a laundry list of apparent results, and none of that grants eternal life. Look at verse 23. Jesus says, then I will declare to them. Now that word declare means a strong confession. I think that's interesting to get the full effect of Jesus' words. He essentially says, there will be those who make a big confession as they stand before him on that day, and he will respond by saying, here is my confession about you. I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice laws. Now, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying. First, he's not talking about someone losing their salvation. He didn't say, I knew you and forgot you. He doesn't say, I knew you, but you have fallen out of favor with me. He doesn't say, I knew you, but now I reject you. He said, I, what? Never knew you. So this is someone who never had a saving relationship with Jesus Christ they never went through the narrow gate, which is the person of Jesus, you would say. Second, when he says that only those who do the will of the Father are saved and those who practice lawlessness will be cast into hell, some might wrongly conclude Jesus is saying we're saved by what? Our works. There you have it. But this text proves that that's not true. We know that salvation is not based on works elsewhere in Scripture, but it's even here in the context. The context makes it abundantly clear because these people standing for Jesus were claiming to do all kinds of works. And none of that was able to save them from hell. So what does Jesus mean by do the will of the Father? Well, I think if we wanted to dive in more deeply, if we had the time, and you can do this yourself by reading the sermon, to understand that all Jesus says in the conclusion of his sermon, we just look to the body of his sermon, because he's already defined these things for us. You see these people described in Matthew 7 are not coming as Jesus already described in his introduction in Matthew 5, in this, ser in this Sermon on the Mount, with an attitude of what? They're not coming with an attitude of being spiritually bankrupt. There is no mourning. There's bragging. They don't hunger for righteousness. They're self-righteous. It was all about outward appearance with, with no evidence of genuine heart change that produced a broken and contrite heart. When we enter the narrow gate, we acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy as sinners who have nothing to offer God but our sin. We mourn over our sin because we know we deserve God's wrath. We humble ourselves before Him and we hunger and thirst for the righteousness that He alone can give us. We meet Jesus at the narrow gate knowing there's no good in us. And we know that on judgment day too. We confess our sin. We surrender to His Lordship. We say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. None of these people that Jesus describes coming to Him on Judgment Day sound like John Newton, the author of the great hymn, Amazing Grace. And here is what he said. If I ever reach heaven, I expect to find three wonders there. First, to meet some I had not thought to see there. Second, to miss some I had thought to meet there. And third, the greatest wonder of all, to find myself there. John Newton is the type of person 
Jesus meets at the narrow gate. Jesus knows you by name on judgment day because he first met you broken, humbled, spiritually hungry at the narrow gate. And if you try to enter through the wide gate, he will declare he never knew you. He will tell you to depart from him because he never met you in this sense. But what if Jesus is saying, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness? Well, Jesus is warning about a verbal profession that doesn't flow out of a changed heart that results in a changed life, where our life doesn't match our profession. When we come to God for salvation, we are not only forgiven by His grace, but by that same grace, we're being remade into the image of His Son. Grace is not about the overlooking of sin. Grace, God's grace, is about the enabling power to transform sinners to become sons of God. And that change produces righteousness that exceeds a righteous veneer, that exceeds the righteous veneer of the Pharisees. Because right after Jesus said that about the Pharisees, He then explained the law in a way that the Pharisees had distorted. He explained lawlessness. You see, Jesus isn't preaching cheap grace. In rejecting the deeds of these individuals, he isn't saying, hey, listen, here's what you need. Just feel really good if you've never done anything. You've done very little. You're on the right track. No. He didn't say there's nothing we should do. He said, do the will of the Father as opposed to practicing lawlessness. And again, let the Sermon on the Mount inform you. How did Jesus confront the practice of the lawlessness of the Pharisees in Matthew 5? Not by lowering the bar. In one sense, not even raising it. Just revealing what it always had been. He says, you have heard it said, but I said. No, I got a new word for you. I'm just fixing what they messed up. He said in 522 that if you harbor anger in your heart towards someone or slander them with your words, you're guilty enough to go into the fire of hell. He said in 528, if you look upon a woman with lust for her, that you've committed the lawlessness of adultery in your heart, yet we have evangelicals that want to defend women dressing scantily. Lawlessness. And if we practice that, if that's the pattern of our life, we are going to lead people to hell because we're teaching them to be comfortable with their lawlessness. He then addressed the lawlessness of those who belittle the marriage covenant. Let that sink in when you see divorce and remarriage with no biblical grounds ravage the church of Jesus. If your life is characterized by practicing lawlessness, you're self-deceived to think you'll enter Christ's kingdom. We are not saved by our obedience, but if we're saved, it will be evidenced by a life that conforms to the character of the citizens of His kingdom. I find so much of this in the book of James. James 2.17, faith without works is... In fact, I believe that James is giving us a commentary, an expanded explanation of the Sermon on the Mount. Check it out sometime. It's amazing how much of the language in James is pulled from Sermon on the Mount. It's not living in perfection. It's being progressively sanctified, as we've heard. While all saints are not conformed to the same degree. There are so many saints that I'm around that I look at and I say, Lord, I need to look more like you. That looks like you in their life, and it doesn't look like me right now. There are saints that I see that in various degrees are more than me, and I long to be like them. But while all saints are not conformed to the same degree, all saints are in the process of being transformed to some degree. And if you're not being transformed to some degree, you may be self-deceived. If we're saved, the fruit of Christ's kingdom is being displayed in our lives. And when we fail, what do we do? We mourn over those sins. We confess them. We seek to be further transformed. And we remind ourselves that if anyone confesses his sin, God is faithful and just. 
to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We are a spiritual work in progress, and our lives are progressively being built upon Christ. You could use the illustration of building a house, which is exactly what Jesus does. I used to live in Florida, another great state, I understand. <laughs> We're all for including as many good states as possible. But I quickly learned about what are called sinkholes living there. Thank God I never had one, but a sinkhole is a natural hole under the earth's surface that develops over time due to erosion. It's completely undetectable by just looking at the ground. In fact, you often don't know there's a sinkhole until it just opens up. On more than one occasion while living there, I saw, I saw homes that had partially collapsed into a sinkhole. And it was sad to see a beautiful, expensive homes even destroyed because of an underlying sinkhole that just appeared, although it was always there below the surface. When I lived there, testing for sinkholes was incredibly expensive. The only clue was to look for visible cracks to the structure of the home especially the foundation. The presence of cracks was a good sign you would, should stay away from buying that house because no one would knowingly buy a home on top of a sinkhole. So Jesus, thirdly, because he tells us about dangers from without and dangers from within, he now thirdly moves to a tale of two houses. When Jesus talked about a man building a house on sound, sand, the crowd would have immediately seen that that's a foolish thing to do. Why would anyone be foolish enough to build a house on sand? The answer is, they wouldn't. You'd have to be out of your mind. Just as no one would willingly buy a house on top of a sinkhole. And in Jesus' final illustration, here's what it's stake, is at stake. Your house, your life, is either going to stand on Judgment Day or completely collapse. There are only two ways to live and only two possible outcomes for your life. Jesus saw the world this way because that's how the world is. And the warning is issued to those who have come to hear Jesus. You can't hear my words. These folks are doing what? They're hearing Jesus. Those who claim to follow Him at the Day of Judgment that sounds like us. <laughs> We've come this week to hear the words of Jesus. Paid money. <laughs> to hear the word of Jesus. We're the serious hearers. Not the passive hearers. I do know there are a lot of people who listen to Jesus and listen to the words of Jesus the way most of us will do on our way home on the flight, listening to a flight attendant explain all the safety instructions. It's passive. It kind of, we're used to hearing it so often, we just read our magazine. But these on this mountainside had also gathered to hear Jesus speak. They had most likely sat for a long time listening to him preach without the aid of microphones, no nursery, no comfortable seats, no lively music. Just them coming and listening evidenced a certain level of commitment that you don't see from many churchgoers today. Imagine if Joss had sent you a word that, hey, our pews have been taken out, you're going to sit on the ground. This crowd would not have all been here. I wouldn't have been here. <laughs> And yet, with all of this supposed commitment, Jesus has a stern warning. If you're looking for cracks in the foundation, the problem may not be visible in what you say, Lord, Lord. It might not even be visible in your desire to hear, just as they were. The cracks often are visible in what they do or don't do with what they hear. Those in Christ's kingdom not only call Jesus Lord and come to hear the Lord speak, 
But they also do the most important thing, the most fundamental thing. They apply his words. They obey. They alter their lives to bring them into conformity with the teaching of Jesus, Jesus and the lordship of our Savior. Jesus is calling them to build their lives upon the foundation of his teaching, to conform their thoughts and desires, their words and actions to his gospel. You just heard me, Jesus says, preach. You heard. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Saving faith is the positive response to a truth presented. When the Word of God is declared, it calls for a response. Therefore, our doing is absolutely critical because it reveals who and what we are. Every time we hear the Word, we must act upon it, brothers and sisters. Every time you sit under the Word of God, you're making a choice that we either give evidence you've entered the narrow gate or expose cracks in your foundation that might suggest you're on the broad path and headed to destruction. Each of us will leave this conference and we'll make a choice to build upon the firm foundation of Christ's words or we'll build upon sand. Is hearing and doing evident in your life? Again, James 1.22, don't just be hearers of the Word, but what? Doers. Yes, it requires God's grace. Anybody who says that you need to work for your salvation doesn't understand grace. And anyone who says you can be saved without works doesn't understand grace. Because grace changes us. It transforms us. And unless we reach the point of actually doing what Jesus says, we are not followers of Jesus by His own definition. Jesus demands a believing response and it's not ultimately about making a one-time decision. Being a Christian is about being a lifetime obedient disciple. Many people make a decision and then spend their lives rationalizing away Jesus' words. Jesus wants us to examine ourselves to be sure we're not self-deceived. And in this illustration, both hear Jesus, both in the context make claims of devotion to Jesus. They're both building their lives and a home. They both face the same wind and the same rain, but they don't end up in the same place. The difference is the foundation. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man, Jesus says, a wise man. Anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them is like a foolish man. What you do with Jesus' words determines whether you're building on rock or sand, whether you're wise or foolish, whether your life will stand or fall. From Jesus' sermon, hearing and doing Jesus' words is seen. Let me just draw from the Sermon on the Mount. In a love that loves your enemies, and does good to those who hate you, blesses those who curse you, and praise for those who mistreat you. It's doing to others as you would have them do to you. It's seeking first His kingdom. It's a life that deals with the log of sin in your own eye before you deal with the sin in the lives of others. It is forgiving and giving to others. It involves examining the fruit of your speech to see the evidence of a genuine heart change. This is what it means. Build a house upon the rock. This is the life that will stand. And you can't do it without saving grace. Justifying grace. Sanctifying grace. If this is not the path you're on, then where are you deriving your confidence that you're spiritually okay? What will you say to Jesus on that day? Any feeble claims we may have will ring just as hollow as those did in Jesus' example, maybe even more so. Lord, Lord, did I not put up Bible verses on Facebook in your name? <laughs> did I not pray a prayer when I was 10 years old? Did I not attend G3 conferences? Did I not care about sound doctrine? And I memorized the Ordo Salutis. 
Did I not pray a chapter from the Valley of Vision every morning? Did I not quote Spurgeon in every sermon <laughs> and memorize Calvin's Institutes? None of that matters if you are not walking according to the will of the Father and obeying Jesus' words. Jesus was clear elsewhere. If you love me, you will keep my command. No one will enter heaven who does not love Jesus. And it's a deeper thing than calling Him Lord. It's living under His Lordship, building your life upon His words. What cracks have been exposed in your spiritual house this week? The spiritual foundation this week? The cracks of an unforgiving spirit? Deep-rooted bitterness? The cracks of an addiction that you continue to hide rather than turn from? The cracks of consuming materialism, a dullness to God's Word. Don't ignore the foundational cracks that God has exposed. doesn't mean you're lost. I'm simply saying, when you see a crack, 1 John 1, 9. No one will enter heaven merely on the basis of lips who profess Jesus as Lord, but lives that evidence Jesus as Lord. And all of us should examine to see whether you have a vital relationship, an authentic slaving relationship with Jesus Christ. Examine yourself to see if what you're building will stand when judgment day arrives. Don't leave this conference having only heard. Enter the narrow gate. Lord, Lord. I am a broken sinner. I met you at the narrow gate. I left self behind. I knew I was spiritually bankrupt. I came to you for the righteousness I needed. I picked up my cross and followed you as I walked on the narrow path by the same grace that brought me through the narrow gate. And every day I built my life on the foundation of your words by your grace. And I knew I would never make it safely home. if you didn't guarantee that I would. But don't miss this important and wonderful fact. The positive side of the promise, those who build their lives on Jesus and His words will stand. No matter what comes their way, they will stand. They will stand in this life and they will stand in the next. And it will be a life well lived, even if it looks foolish to the world. Building on sand is easy, but in the end, there is eternal loss. Building on the rock of Jesus and His teaching is difficult. It recalls for sacrifice. But in the end, there is eternal reward. And no matter what comes, it will be worth it. Many years ago, after graduating from Yale University, William Borden became a missionary candidate planning to go to China. And many of his friends thought his plans were foolish. He actually came from a very good family in their eyes. He had, that family had wealth and influence. His friends thought he had all that was needed to build a successful life in this world. Why throw your life away in some foreign country when you have such a great life here? But William Borden felt the burden to give his life in obedience to the Great Commission, specifically in a foreign land. On his way to China, he became sick before he even had a chance to do anything. It soon became evident that he was going to die, actually. He certainly could have allowed the voices of those who had discouraged him from going in the first place, those who, some of them may have been on the broad path, saying, join us, join us. He could have heard them ringing in his ears, what a waste. What if I had just enjoyed building my life back in New Haven? I could have lived a long and successful life. But Borden did not think this way. He defined success according to the words of Jesus. And he laid on his deathbed in Egypt, never having made it to China. And he scribbled a goodbye note to be sent to his friends. No reserve. No retreat. 
no regrets. How could he say such a thing? Because he, because he built his life on the firm foundation of Christ. And when the storms of life hit him, his house did not fall, but stood strong. If today were the end of your life, are the things you're pursuing with your life now allow you to scribble the words, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. If you gave your life fully to Christ as a true disciple, those will be your dying words. Enter the narrow gate. Walk the narrow path. Beware of the danger of deceptive false teachers who are dangerous and will drag you down the broad path. And be, be careful about the danger of self-deception within. And every day build your life on the foundation of Jesus' words. But we need to end this sermon exactly where Jesus ended His. Because in the beginning, He talked about decept uh, uh, destruction and then life. In the end, He talks about life and ends with destruction. So let His words ring, not mine. What we do with Jesus' words determine whether we will stand or fall. And if you hear Jesus' words and don't do them, great will be the fall. When you hear Jesus' faithful words, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And if that doesn't make you run toward the narrow gate, you really haven't understood the warning. May God help us to hear and do. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. But we don't want to just hear it. We want to be changed by it. And we know that we cannot do that of our own effort and our own will. So we pray right now your spirit would convict our hearts, expose those foundational crafts, cracks, and call us, cause us to fall on our knees, confess our sin, and surrender to your lordship even now so that we may end our life say no retreat, no regrets. In the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen.